Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. This is the fifth Sunday of Lent. We're almost there. Only one more Sunday of Lent left. That's next Sunday, Palm Sunday. And it seems like, and I'm sure there's no accident behind this, but it seems like the closer and closer we get to Holy Week, the sections we have from God's Holy Word to consider more and more strongly make us feel that need for a Savior. And more and more strongly show that Savior's love and the amazingness of that salvation He provides for us. It makes us more and more want to hold on to this great thing our God gives us, gives us and hold it out for other people to have as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We'll sing our first hymn. <clears throat> to worship with humble and penitent hearts. 
Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first scripture lesson for this day is written for us in the 43rd chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. And here... Isaiah has the people think back to God's deliverances and how powerful and how amazing and how mighty and how gracious they always were as he delivered them out of the land of slavery, as he would soon deliver them out of the captivity. But he does this then pointing ahead to an even greater deliverance. He says, think of how powerful, think of how mighty, think of how gracious those deliverances were. Well, you ain't seen nothing yet as I deliver you and make you my holy people. Isaiah 43, verses 16 through 21. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, 
And they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. This is God's word. We proclaim his praise in the psalm of the day. And, and here's a psalm. It's, uh, I know I've shared this with many people. This is my favorite psalm. Because at the beginning, the psalm writer stands as, as, a, as a, just a total image of me as a sinner, not, not counting on my God, not trusting his goodness, and questioning and second-guessing him. And he brings up all these perennial questions. Well, if God is so good, and God is so loving, and God is so powerful, why do the good things happen to the bad people? And why do the bad things happen to the good people? And God says, you don't even know what you're talking about. They don't. And finally, the, the psalm writer comes to that as he says, okay, when I stop with all my questioning and listen to what God has to say in his holy word, then I understand. Then I understand the final outcome. And then I don't even want to talk like that because of the way it hurts me and the way it might discourage the others of God's people. Our God is always with us. If you need proof, look at his son, Psalm 73. I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my Savior. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. In our gospel lesson for this day, Jesus was talking to people who didn't really want to listen to them. They said they already had their religion. They knew what it should be. And so Jesus reads something to them from their religion, and they still didn't get it. He was reading to them from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, and they didn't know about it. He was talking about this, this section in Isaiah 5 where God was talking about this wonderful vineyard. He had done everything and to set up perfectly, and then he expected to see some wonderful grapes come out of that vineyard, and he saw nothing but rotten and, and bitter grapes. And he wonders in this parable, what more could I possibly have done for my vineyard? Jesus says the same thing. What more could I possibly have done for my people? Luke chapter 20, verses 9 through 19. 
He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat it and treated shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, May this never be. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately, because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. This is God's word. mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Part of God's word for our consideration this day is recorded for us in the third chapter of the letter to the church of the Philippians verses 7 through 14. But whatever was to my profit I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow 
to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God. Dear friends in Christ, a long, long, long time ago when I was back away at high school, there was this kid at our school and his name was Kirby. I don't remember his last name and I don't know if I ever did know his last name. Kirby was kind of a strange character. He had those Coke bottle bottle lenses for his glasses and he still couldn't see very well. And he always talked to himself and it was always loud and very animatedly. But that wasn't the strange thing about Kirby. The strange thing about Kirby was his collection of bottle caps. I'm not talking about special bottle caps on special bottles or rare collector ones. I'm just talking about any and all bottle caps. He had boxes and boxes and boxes of them. He'd take them out of the pop machines all over campus. And when those were all empty, he'd go downtown and looking for the soda pop machines just to scoop out all the bottle caps. He'd dig through the trash and he'd find these bottle caps. It didn't matter how dirty, how bent, how rusty. He had boxes upon boxes upon boxes of bottle caps. And he wasn't, he wasn't out searching for bottle caps. He was sorting and counting and resituating his boxes of bottle caps. He was the only one in the whole dormitory that didn't have a roommate because there was no room for a roommate with all those boxes of bottle caps around. And eventually there was no room for Kirby in the school. Because after a while it became very apparent that he was spending so much time with his bottle caps he wasn't doing any of his school work. And then he even started to skip classes to go out and look for more and more bottle caps. So finally, Kirby was asked to leave. And once in a while, I find myself wondering, well, I wonder where Kirby is. I wonder what he's doing today. Now, wouldn't it be weird if this guy were still collecting those bottle caps? If now he's got his whole house full of them, his garage, storage lockers filled with all these old bottle caps just collecting dust and rust. Wouldn't that be weird? Wouldn't it be strange if he were still doing that instead of, you know, making a living and having a life and a, and a family? And, and yet, that was 40-some years ago. Of course he's not still doing that. He couldn't still be that crazy, could he? Well, have you noticed how much people like to hang on to their things? I'm not just talking about people on the Hoarders show on TV. That's, a, that, that's crazy talk, right? But I mean, even homeless people today. I remember when I was a kid, the homeless people, they had it all packed up nicely in this one little bundle on the end of a stick as they walked. Now they gotta have at least two shopping carts to hold all their stuff. And it's not just for the recycled stuff that they can turn in and get cash. When you see some of the junk and the garbage that is in there, have you seen this guy that lives behind the storage lockers over on Enos or by the, the office depot? His stuff, I mean, he's got quite the rig and he's got bicycles on both sides of it. And, that wouldn't even fit into any of the rental lockers that they have there for it. And it's crazy, isn't it? Who could hang on to so much stuff that was so worthless? Apparently, it's a trait that is common to all of us, the way God tells it in his holy word. The Apostle Paul, he says he was like that too. He used to be like that. As he tells us, there was a time when he was about collecting bottle caps until he discovered the difference. And here's the difference, and he wants to share that with us. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I consider them all rubbish. And you might not have caught it here, but in his original language, in his original day, he's using some accounting terms here. And he's saying all along, he wasn't even putting the things in the right categories. He says he had been mixing up the liabilities and assets categories all along through his whole life and didn't even realize it. And he wonders how many of us are doing that as well. Like someone once said, you can get to heaven without riches. You can get to heaven without wealth. You can get rich to heaven without friends. You can get to heaven without prestige or popularity or power, but you can't get there without Jesus. And that's what God is telling us here in his holy word. All those other things, that's just stuff. Rubbish, he calls it here. Short-term pleasures, trash, garbage, because the only thing that really matters is Jesus. 
Christ and his righteousness. Now you try telling some little kid that that little plastic ring you got out of the gumball machine isn't a valuable treasure. You try telling one of these little guys that those rocks are sticking out in their pockets and want to take home with them later isn't the most valuable thing on the face of the earth at this point in time. And you try telling some of us bigger kids that our toys and recreation and pleasures and cares and worries and concerns and positions of power and influence are really nothing more than those stones or those little plastic rings. Yeah, the world shakes their head at us with this condescending little grin. Oh, those silly little naive Christians. They don't know what they're missing out on by putting Jesus in such a high position in their lives. And even though you couldn't argue or rationally convince any of those people otherwise, and God tells us we couldn't because he says in 1 Corinthians 2, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God because they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. But it's actually the sin and unbelief that is absolute foolishness. That doesn't make any sense at all. From the very first sin on, when the devil got Adam and Eve to even entertain in their minds this thought that this God, this amazing, wonderful, gracious God, who had just completely outdone himself in this, this creation that he had put them in the center of, that this God who had lavished upon them every possible, imaginable, and unimaginable blessing, everything they could ever want or need, that somehow this God was now, after doing all that, this God was envious of them and wanted to deprive them of some good, beneficial thing? Doesn't even make sense that this God who so powerfully created the entire universe and everything in it now scratching his head and can't figure out what to do with that one mistake he made with that one, that one tree there and so he has to resort to a ruse or a threat. It's crazy talk. It's foolishness. It doesn't make any sense and yet the devil convinced those, those first people exactly of that and it's no different in our day. We'll shake our heads at those immature people, you know, the, those millennials. They, and and they're, they're so short-term and so short-sighted. It's all about this instant gratification. And isn't it, isn't it funny how our parents' generation said the same thing about us? But, but, but we shake our heads at those people for being so short-sighted, right? They'll, 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 they'll not take any thought to the future. And they want what they want, and they want it right now. This illicit sex and the drugs and all this. And just for some short-term pleasure and they're not considering any long-term circumstances or outcomes at all and Jesus tells us we need to hear that same speech as he tells it to one of his good friends named Martha he says Martha Martha you're worried and upset about so many things but only one thing is needed Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her Mary, her sister, who thought that listening to Jesus and what Jesus had to say was the most important thing of all. And she was right. She was right because Jesus was her righteousness. Just like he is our righteousness. Those people that Paul was originally writing to, the Philippian, the Philippian Christians, they had their priorities straight. They knew that no amount of power or prestige or material wealth would even begin to compare with the glory that God has in store for us in the eternal life in heaven. They were sure of that. They had their priorities straight. They knew it was about Jesus, not all the stuff down here. And yet Paul says still they had this one problem. He calls it putting confidence in the flesh. And Paul says, hey, don't, don't worry, I know exactly where you're coming from. But I also know exactly where you're going if we don't get a handle on this, putting confidence in your flesh. He says, I've been there, done that. He says, if anyone thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. When it came to being a righteous on this earth kind of person, Paul was the cat's meow. Paul was a Pharisee. He was the best of the best. That these guys were so good at keeping God's rules and laws that they had to make some more rules of their own up just to, just to make it more challenging, I guess. 
But he was the best of the best. When you look at it, wow, is there a good person there? And when he looked inside himself, wow, is this a good person here? And yet he says all that he prided himself in before, that belongs in that rubbish pile. And the word he's using for rubbish doesn't look or nice, as nice or smell as nice as we might be thinking of with this word rubbish. It's the word God was talking about when in Isaiah he said even the best of the best of our good deeds are before him as filthy rags. That was the best that a human could offer. You know, when I was at a previous parish, I was up on the church roof and had the fellowship hall going away from it. And I was getting some balls down. I don't know whose kids got balls up there on the church roof, but somebody's kids got balls up there, so I was getting them down. And as I was getting them down, I saw on the little patio, the constructed nice little patio thing covered they had over there. Oh, there's some more over there that I'd have to get down to. And for just a brief moment, I considered jumping across from the roof to that patio cover. It would say, hey, it would save me some time. You're just like my wife. It would save me some time going down the ladder and then going, and then I'd have to find my own ladder to put up on that. And it would just... But I thought better of it and went down the ladder. And just to check, I stood on the ground at the edge of where the roof line of one was and the other one and realized I couldn't jump that far. You're right, it would have been stupid. In fact, some would say even this, the fact that I entertained that thought for even a moment was not too smart in the first place. And yet, as foolish as that was, there are still people alive on the face of this earth who think they can make the jump from all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, there's no one right, not even one. They can jump all the way across to be perfect as I, the Lord your God, am perfect. A lot farther than it was between that fellowship hall roof and the patio covering roof. A giant chasm that no human being could ever make it across. And God's word tells us as much as, as much as anyone tries to minimize their sin or redefine sin or, or minimize his justice and, and his judgment, there's no way anyone can make it across. It's like jumping across the Grand Canyon. And, and if you ever tried to jump across the Grand Canyon, just a little word of warning, you got to make it all at once. You can't do it in a couple steps. And no one ever could. And that's the position that we were in with all the best of what we could do in the worthless pile. Not just not an asset, but actually a liability. So our text considers, so I consider all that rubbish. Rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having that righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but the one that is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God. The greatest Thing the Apostle Paul had, the greatest thing we have, the greatest thing that we want everyone to have is this recognition that the monopoly money of our own good deeds that can't pay off anything that left us in the not righteous liabilities category that can't get us anywhere, well, Christ's righteousness, the perfect righteousness that could and that did pay the way for us. As Jesus didn't just jump across the chasm, he constructed a bridge across that chasm for it. But he came to our side to do it. He came to our side as one of us to live our life perfectly righteous and so we could get credit for that righteous. But all the time we're getting his assets, he's getting our liabilities. As he became, we're told, imputed. A fancy word for saying he got the credit, the blame for all the guilt of all our sin and carried it with him all the way to that one trip to Golgotha. Literally a walk to hell and back. And as he took our guilt with him, he left his righteousness with us. That's why Luther used to like that little prayer. He said all so often that, Dear Lord Jesus, I am your sin, you are my righteousness. You became what you were not so that I could become what I was not. Kind of like what God is telling us in 2 Corinthians 5. God made that one who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Yeah, the rest is rubbish because Christ is our righteousness. And now that Christ, our righteousness, come, tells us to come heavenward. Come, receive that, what I paid for you already. Receive it. It's yours already. You might as well enjoy it. The victory is yours. The deed to eternal life, it's signed already with Jesus' blood. It's sealed with his resurrection from the dead. And it's in our hands. 
And here again, the thing that doesn't make sense to the rest of the people that are counting their bottle caps, this also makes Christianity something eminently practical for here and now, right here as we live this life. Not that I've already obtained all this, or already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Forgetting what's behind, straining toward what's ahead, I press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Yeah, perfect forgiveness is ours right here, right now. Yes, perfect adoption into the family, God's eternal family. Perfect justification where God says, I see you as perfect and holy as I see my one and only son. But that rest of it, Paul says, I haven't quite grabbed that yet. I haven't gotten to the point where I am as perfectly holy as God sees me for the sake of my son. And that will never happen on this side of heaven. He says, because I have that sinful nature. That sinful nature that makes it so those good things I don't, that I want to do, I don't always do. And those bad things I don't want to do, that's what I keep on doing. So that's the struggle. That's the thing he's talking about here. That's this race he's giving us. Not a 40-yard dash or some 50-meter sprint. This is a long, lifelong marathon race. And there are obstacles and hurdles in it to make it even more fun, like that steeplechase course, right? But there's also the goal line. There's also the finish line there. And that, he tells us, is our focus. The eternal life that we have because of Jesus. And just like any good runner knows, while you're running, you don't look around, and you especially don't look back, because while you're doing that, you break form, you break stride. You might step out of your lane, you might get disqualified, you might slow yourself down, you might stumble and fall. So he says, we don't. We keep sighting up on what is to come. We don't look back trying to pat ourselves on the back for all those good things we do. And we don't look back and worry about all those evil things that we've done in the past, those sins that make us feel so bad. They're in the past. They're forgiven. Don't let Satan remind you of what God has already forgotten. Look ahead eagerly to that day. And just like in a race, when you can see that finish line, you see that finish line and you see that stand there and you know you can feel those gold medals bouncing on your chest. You can hear that national anthem singing in your ear. You can see yourself up there on that medal stand only this time you're getting the crown of life. And as you see all those things, you're making it around that last, that last curve and there's the home stretch. You get a second win and you want to kick it in even harder and run even faster and that's us. We can see that, that finish line more and more clearly every day. We want to kick it in and we want to finish strong and we get our second win. And we want to live more and better to the glory of our God and serve him more and better. And we want to love and serve each other more and better. And all that other stuff, yeah, it's just stuff. Rubbish. Stuff that gets in the way. We've got no time for that. We've got something better to do. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having listened to the word of our God, we now have the opportunity to declare the faith he's given us. We do that this morning using the words of the Nicene Creed, as you find it on page 9. Would you please stand? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.
Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sin. May this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for all of your sins. Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.
May this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Thank you. 